Okay, got it. Welcome to the Petro Papers podcast. Say that 10 times fast. This is where you get your oil and gas intellectual stimulation by asking the technical questions. I'm Yoga Sri Pradhan, and with me here today, I have Isaac Iso from Geolog. I'm going to read a little bit about Isaac before we start peppering him with questions. Let me pull up the information. He's joined the oil and gas industry in 1991 as a well site logging geologist after completing his master's in geology from the University of Mumbai, India. He worked as a field engineer in various oil field drilling locations in India, Southeast Asia, Middle East, and Africa as a well site geologist, formation pressure evalu evaluation geologist. Since 2006, he joined the formation evaluation team to support real time drilling, monitoring, and operations in North America, Latin America, and West Africa. Since 2011, he has focused on interpretation and operation support for conventionals and unconventionals in North America as a domain champion for formation evaluation, providing technical support in real time reservoir characterization services based in Houston, Texas. Currently, Isaac is active in promoting and executing reservoir characterization services, utilizing advanced surface logging, reservoir fluid characterization, organic and inorganic geochemical techniques for projects in U.S. onshore, Alaska, and offshore Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. Much of the work is performed on drilling rig sites at and at Geologues Houston Lab with the sophisticated benchtop instruments. The technologies utilized are real-time reservoir fluid and rock evaluation with advanced that mud gas quantity, quality, compositions, and isotopes, XRF elemental composition, XRD mineralogy, TOC, pyrolysis, thermal extraction, GC, and digital cuttings characterization. Today, we're going to talk about ERTEC 372-3283. Paper title and the description is in the description box for our viewers and listeners. Welcome to the podcast, Isaac. Thank you very much, Yogeshri. Thank you for having me. and. Uh organizing this and setting this up. Thank you so much. Of course. Before we reorient our viewers and listeners regarding the paper, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. The first question is, what does Geolog do? Thank you. Yeah. So Geolog, you know, is a company set up in Italy um, in 1982 as a surface logging provider. And this year is celebrating 40 years at Wellside Experience has operated in about 70 plus uh, countries worldwide and six continents, uh, you know, 1700 employees currently and uh, 300 mobile laboratories. So basically we have well site mobile laboratories, you know, sometimes we have got geochemistry trailers at the well site. Uh, they can be offshore, onshore, you know, in different uh, environments worldwide, right? We also have wells, up there in Alaska, you know, in very, very cold, uh, extreme cold conditions in North Slope, or, you know, in the super hot deserts in, in the Middle East. Uh, Geolog is also uh, focused entirely on surface logging solutions. So that means we have well site, you know, uh, geological solutions, drilling related solutions like drilling monitoring, primary well control, drilling performance, efficiencies, well bore, uh, stability, port pressure evaluations, focused on rig safety as well. Then it comes to the reservoir characterization part of uh, the story. We have uh, while drilling, well site, real time characterization of the reservoirs, uh, high tech uh, lab analysis, you know, both inorganic and organic geochemistry, um, high resolution uh, captures of digital images. Uh, some geomechanics, uh, whatever is possible within the, you know, the framework of what we have. And then our surface services are obviously, uh, you know, deployed in many areas in North America, especially in the unconventionals. We have gained a lot of experience and expertise, uh, logging wells also for an, uh, on the conventionals and also some in the geothermal world. Uh, Geolog is also, you know, involved in R&D projects, sometimes joint ventures with uh, major global oil operators, oil and gas drilling operators as well. Awesome. Well, it's good to know that there is a wide breadth and depth with, uh, with the company. Now I wanted to ask a question related to the paper. 
I was wondering if you can orient our viewers and listeners on what the paper is about and the motivation behind the paper. Very good, thank you, yeah. So, you know, um, this paper is, you know, I think the, the key message here is, you know, let's say the key, key word for us, at least from our perspective is uh, integration. You know, integrating variety of techniques, um, data sets, uh, especially in a world where, you know, today where operators are more cost conscious, you know, they've been, obviously operators are always cons cost conscious for several years now, especially since, you know, oil industry uh, took a little bit of a downturn uh, a few years ago, right? So when it becomes more cost conscious, uh, there's not a whole lot of logging going on on the well sites. Uh, open hole logging is far and few. Cutting hole cores is again, far and few. You know, you, you might get uh, a few pilot holes once in a while and get some core and data collection. But, uh, you know, from the surface logging perspective, there's a whole lot of uh, data that we can acquire. And uh, drillers obviously are cost conscious on the AFEs. Um, then of course you have the completions and the, and the, uh, the costs involved with that and uh, production processes, you know, how we, can, how, how we can provide cost-effective solutions by integrating a whole lot of data sets. So when, you know, <clears throat> in the uh, public eye, you know, surface logging can be very basic, right? <clears throat> but we are focused on uh, a lot of techniques. So we're looking also at the formation evaluation workflow. So we generated and derived a workflow and a framework for you know this area, especially in the Delaware Basin. And we tested that on a multi-well case study in the Northern Delaware Basin in, uh, in the Southeast New Mexico site. <clears throat> so this approach you know, provides a real-time solution, subsurface characterization for enabling key drilling and completions decisions and optimizing future well planning and target selections. So drilling, completions, well planning, target selections, uh, these kind of optimizations are possible with this data sets. So these were uh, early wells in a series of wells that you know, are on an ongoing project for the operator in Southeast New Mexico. So the operator in this case is Marshall and Winston, and they've been very kind and generous to uh, you know, help us with sharing the data, data release and everything. So we have uh, a lot of collaboration with the operators. So we tested this workflow in the first two wells last year and then extrapolated uh, and improved on it in recent wells, uh, you know, which were drilled this year. And furthermore, we obtained production uh, oil samples and production trends. So it became a whole lot bigger than where we started it. Uh, in the paper, of course, we haven't had a uh, chance to incorporate the latest, uh, you know, wells. We, we put some parts of insights that we learned, we added there. The focus has been primarily on uh, the productive horizons in that area, in uh, the Avalon, second bone spring sand, and the third bone spring carbonate. <laughs> or some operators call that the Harkey Mill sand, which you can see that. Uh, in the uh, you know many wells in that area in, in Northern Reeves and Loving County operators do mention that as Hakimel sand, uh, but generally speaking, it's within the third bone spring carbonate interval. These horizons are investigated for vertical heterogeneities to select optimal landing points for laterals. So there are potentially multiple benches, right? So this is early on in the in the stage of evaluation, uh, starting with these uh, formations. The Avalon is not necessarily a target there, but you know other operators are producing from that particular area. So the in, in the unconventional place, the you know the first data sets that we get is uh, with surface logging. So what do you have from surface logging? We do advanced mud gas quant you know quantitative mud gas evaluation using high end uh, technologies that are deployed at well site, acquiring mud gas uh, from from the uh, drilling mud while drilling in the C1 to C8 light and spectrum. So we call that as a light and spectrum because we're looking at the heavies too later on. Then we look at the stable carbon isotopes, uh, you know, 
to get a com continuous log. So it's a continuous logging process. So we have high resolution data sets uh, for every depth step, you know, <clears throat> and uh, we can do fluid typing, the, the, the maturity of the gas, maturity of the source rock potentially linked to that gas, uh, the origin and reservoir heterogeneities. These are focus points for, you know, the light and hydrocarbons. Then we do the XRD and XRF. We also can do the XRF on the well site. And that's what we did on these particular wells. We did the real time X-ray fluorescence at the well site. And then we ship the samples over to the, to the lab to do the XRD. So XRD also is field deployable, but it, you know, it depends on the project and you know, what we can do here. So in this paper, we, we, for this paper and for the work, we did XRD offline, offsite. Then these are the organic, sorry, the inorganic uh, properties of the rock. Then there's the organic side, TOC pyrolysis used to initially screen for organic facies distribution. Then uh, correlating all of these parameters allows for uh, timely decisions, you know, to support well completions and proposed, uh, you know, the improved well placement for uh, supporting future wells planning, because there are other benches which has not yet been drilled laterally. And uh, that will be, you know, in the coming, coming months, years, the operator will choose to plan and prepare based on our findings in, in this particular uh, early wells. Excellent. Thank you for walking us through the paper and the and the and the insights of, of that paper as well. Thank you. Thank you. I want I wanted to pivot a little bit on what you briefly mentioned regarding mud gas. So I wanted to ask what was the significance of mud gas in the analysis for the paper and what's the significance of seeing lighter ends and heavier ends from this analysis? Very good question. You know, the mud gas, you know, of course, is acquired a whole lot by uh, traditional basic mud logging worldwide. You know, it's the primary indicator of uh, the reservoir fluid properties while drilling. But acquiring that, you know, very, um, high detailed uh, you know, resolution uh, with the quantitative uh, focus for the acquisition. When I say quantitative, essentially what we're trying to do is to correlate that to reservoir fluid properties. You know, basically, if you take uh, a fluid sample, let's say in, the, in the, uh, the conventional world, you have a reservoir fluid sample. You, have, you send a downhole fluid, fluid sampling tool and you collect uh, you know, an oil or gas sample, right? And then you send the, uh, the sample to the lab or you have downhole fluid analysis, these type of things. But in these tight reservoirs, uh, these unconventional tight reservoirs, there is no such way to get downhole fluid samples um, with you know, open hole logging tools. Or you know, perhaps you can get DFIT or something like that, right? But, but ultimately, the operator has to wait for the wells to be fracked and then wait for the flow back. And uh, once things stabilize after a few months down the road, perhaps you might get proper uh, understanding of the reservoir fluid properties. You can get a sample, maybe you can send it to a lab, do those analysis. But while drilling, we can capture a lot of this light end spectrum, uh, you know, hydrocarbon analysis from the drilling mud. And uh, it's a challenge because, uh, you know, a lot of these laterals are drilled with oil-based mud and the mud can be very contaminated. So the low end basic mud logging services uh, does not do justice to you know, making a proper interpretation. So we have a very uh, quantified quantitative measurement where we measure hydrocarbons that are flowing out of the well while drilling and also looking at what is the hydrocarbons that it's present in the mud background, contaminants, you know, mud additives, uh, you know, wherever the oil-based mud was sent to the rig location, you know, with all the contaminations from other wells. So we are able to correct for all of those pollutants and, you know, contamination. So then we get the true hydrocarbon composition from the reservoir fluids. And these light end uh, gases, let's say when you say the lightest end, C1, C2, C3, we also do the stable carbon isotopes. So a combination of this, uh, these data sets, you know, we can get um, what is the, uh, the reservoir fluid properties linked to perhaps the gas oil ratio or maybe the condensate gas ratio if you can calibrate that to a model you know from the local area and uh, let's say if your reservoir is very tight let's say if you have a tight rock like carbonate rich rock uh, with very poor porosity very tight rock 
and or it's cemented with you know maybe a sandstone cemented with uh, a lot of calcium and uh, so in such scenarios the the gas quantity is reduced when you drill through that in the world you know there is some hydrocarbons but it's very very minimal or very uh, poor because of the porosity so we are able to correlate you know methane ethane propane the light end gases to the changes in the reservoir properties too so this light end uh, ratio c1 over c3 c4 or c5 you know can give those kind of indicators on uh, you know the reservoir properties storage um, maybe the seal port throat uh, scenarios um, and calcification or something like that and then beyond that looking at the heavier end spectrum you know we look at things like uh, what is a benzene over normal C6 ratio? Traditionally, the industry has used that ratio for um, evaluating, you know, where there is increased water saturation. So there are a couple of other ratios also we can use for perhaps biodegradation. Uh, you know, there are many such things that can be um, understood. Maturity of the source rock, you know, whether it's a dry gas, wet gas, condensate oil, you know, that's a bigger kind of picture, right? But in an area where it's already known that it's going to be an oil producer we look at it looking at these subtle differences in gas ratios in the light end spectrum which uh you know with other type of technologies you don't get this uh light end spectrum right nobody is able to get that if you get it from cuttings you don't get uh the light end volatiles like c1 c2 c3 c4 we don't get that from drill cuttings a whole lot so the free uh volatile hydrocarbons that are released while drilling is extremely important to complete the story what you might be doing with drill cuttings or cores or you know compare that to production right so when you produce the, the oil or the gas everything comes right from the beginning from uh, c1 perhaps even the lighter uh, non-hydrocarbon species like helium co2 uh, you know nitrogen oxygen those all of those things can be acquired from mud gas Thank you for that clarification. I'm really glad that you mentioned about the importance of, of, of mud gas. Now, for our viewers and listeners, and when I was reading the paper, I noticed that there were quite a few acronyms or quite a few processes that may not be familiar for our viewers and listeners. So from an education standpoint, I'm going to list a few processes that I would like for you to talk briefly about. So GCC IRMS, what, what is that? And what's the significance of that for our viewers and listeners? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, of course, that's, it's not very easy because, you know, even in the surface logging world, if you ask a lot of folks, you know, the, these kind of terminologies are not very common. Uh, so, but, um, you know, the lab folks obviously know this uh, and the geochemistry world, because this paper was, you know, geochemistry heavy, you know, and was presented in the geochemistry forum in the Eurotech. So obviously we had to give a lot of these details in the paper to justify, you know, uh, presenting that to, to, to uh, geochemistry subject matter experts who are listening or, you know, in the room, right? So we had to really go into the, dwell deeper into that. So to go basic on that, let's for the, for the sake of, you know, the public, general public and uh, generalists as well, who may be listening, you know, the GCCIRMS stands for Gas Chronography Combustion Isotope Ratio Mass Spectrometry. That sounds like a whole lot because it's a big term for sure. So essentially it's gas chronography and combustion to get isotopic ratios in the lab. So this is the high end version of, uh, you know, the lab analysis for isotopic measurements. So we at Geolog, we do field isotopic analysis of the light end gases like C1, C2, C3, and CO2. But uh, the industry standard has been, you know, for decades to send gas samples to a lab and run it through this GCC IRMS and get the isotopic ratios of, uh, you know, stable carbon isotopes uh, of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on. So the common ones with the industry is used to is stable carbon isotopes and hydrogen isotopes. So for this paper, you know, we have been focused uh, entirely on the stable carbon isotopes. We did not, we did not go beyond that into the hydrogen end uh, of the analysis. 
So for those who don't know much about isotopes, gas isotopes, you know, basically they are isotopes are variations of uh, chemical elements that have the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. So we're looking at the stable carbon isotopes uh, of uh, 12C and 13C, okay? And then we're looking at the ratio differences between the two, because in the nature, you know, 12C is abundant and 13C is depleted, you know? So the depletion is what we're looking at. And uh, we have a ratio called as delta 13C. So this is what comes with the, um, the lab-based uh, service where, you know, where we look at this from, uh, from the lab when we send the gas samples. So we collected the gas samples and we shipped it to the lab. But we also have a real-time, um, you know, analysis. The real-time part of this, you know, I believe it's also on that list, just to clarify that part, is called the CRDS. So it's, that's cavity ring down spectroscopy. So this is what is there in the field for real-time fast field analysis, where, uh, you know, the gas is passing through, uh, you know, through a laser cavity with mirrors and everything. So we look at at the, the decay of that laser beam that passes through that, uh, through that cavity with mirrors. And so that decay is actually captured as the near infrared absorption spectrum. So that ringing down, ring down actually means you kind of go in over a period of time to then characterize the absorption for that specific gas. And that that's converted into isotopic ratios. So that's kind of a general uh, principle of this, um, you know, isotopic analysis at the field and isotopic analysis at the lab. So what do you get from these isotopes? So you get uh, genetic origin of the natural gas, the thermal maturity of the natural gas, you know, correlating these gas samples with the source. Where is this coming from? Each source has, has its own isotopes and fingerprints, you know, and uh, in the vertical characterization, compare that to the lateral is there heterogeneity? Is it all homogeneous? Or do you see a whole lot of difference, you know, from one well to another well? Are they seals? Are they barriers? Are they falls? Are they compartments? Um, and, you know, those things can be very, very um, interesting when you look at it from a field-wide kind of a basin-wide basin perspective as well, you know? So we collected gas samples on all of these wells and uh, did this GCCRMS and also the cavity ring down spectroscopy at the well site. Awesome. So I won't ask you about CRDS since you already mentioned that, but I would like to ask you about GCFID. Very good. Yeah. So GCFID is, you know, is a commonly used um, flame ionization. So FID means uh, flame ionization detector and GC of course is gas chromatography. So we're looking at uh, is a standard gas, um, you know, is a standard in, in, uh, instrument used in the industry for measuring hydrocarbons and gas concentrations. So your total gas detectors, uh, if you look at the mud log, you'll see the C1 to C5 characterization. So different companies use different devices. So Geolog uses the FID. So, you know, the optimum sample gas is introduced into a FID uh, through a column. So we have columns inside the detector and uh, inside the, you know, the gas chromatography uh, equipment. And the gas passes through the column and then they're separated based on their molecular weight. Any hydrocarbon gas sample will produce ions when it is burnt in the hydrogen flame uh, inside due to the combustion, okay? So the combustion takes place and uh, at the burner and then you get the ions. And that's translated into a signal and you get the gas, you know, the total gas uh, quantity or, you know, maybe in PPM or whichever units you're measuring it in. And then you have independent gases like C1, C2, C3, C4, C5. Usually, you know, up to C5 is what the mud loggers do. But then you can go beyond that to the C6, 7, 8, and on, so on with the aromatics and everything. So that's the FID system that we do at the well site, you know, for the high end, uh, C1 to C8, quantitative mud gas evaluation. So we go beyond and uh, do aromatics, cycloalkanes, and uh, N-alkanes uh, beyond C5. Awesome. And the last one I wanted to ask you was TEGC. Very good. So, you know, uh, for this characterization at the well site, we have 
an additional uh, technique where we go beyond the C8. So C1 to C8 is from the mud gas, right? Because that's the limitation of what you can get from the mud gas because you're looking at the free hydrocarbons in the mud. But then the rest of the hydrocarbons, which are, let's say, if it is an oil well, you know, uh, produ oil producer, the rocks uh, perhaps have C9 plus hydrocarbon. So what can we look at? Maybe some of the oils uh, in the Delaware Basin where the, the maturity, you know, again, when, when the maturity is not so high, we might get a whole lot of the spectrum, you know, C9 to all the way up to C30, 35, even, you know. So this equipment that we have, uh, TEGC, is essentially looking at that S1 peak. If you know about pyrolysis, you know, you have the free hydrocarbons that are present in the rocks, right, in, liquid, in the liquid phase. So uh, what we do is thermally extracted. So it's called thermal thermodesorption of hydrocarbons from the rock, from the cuttings. Uh, at a temperature between 300 to 300 degrees, uh, 330 degrees C, okay? I'm not converting that into Fahrenheit, but this is uh, at least from the literature that we have, is carried out by, followed by a GC separation and an FID. So it's a GC separating the gases in the column and then FID detector. This can be done at the well site in real time. So this is like a real time solution that Geolog has, uh, you know, design for fast field, uh, high-end chromatography of the oil that is present in the cuttings, right? Otherwise, you have to wait for the samples to get back to the lab. It, you know, depending on the location and everything, it might take a few weeks, few months, you know, to get these kind of results back. So the fast field analysis is what this objective is for the TEGC, thermal extraction gas chromatography. You can also do the liquid samples uh, if there's a need, you know, with the solvent extracts and the produced oils. But this is designed exclusively for drill cutting. So we wash the cuttings and uh, dry it and you know, pass it through this extraction process. And you know, within 30 minutes, uh, you can get an analysis. You know, let's say one hour per sample with cleaning and everything uh, goes together. Perfect. Thank you for those clarifications. Thank I you. wanted to pivot to some of the results of the paper. <laughs> and some of the visualizations in looking at different formations. What is the significance of pristane over C17, phytane over C18, and pristane over phytane ratios when looking at different formations of the Northern Delaware Basin? Thank you, very, very important um, aspect of this whole fingerprinting, you know. So, you know, apart from the TEGC, thermal extraction GC, we also have a high-end GC mass spectrometry. So the traditional industry methodology for analyzing oils, you know, whole oils, uh, you know, saturates, aromatics, and getting the biomarkers and everything is the GCMS, you know, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. So obviously I'm not talking about that. That's a little bit more intense of a subject. Uh, again, it's a more advanced version of uh, the um, G9 plus, let's say the 9 to 35, what do you do at the field, right? So we take, we screen that, uh, those sample sets for indicators. Maybe we have a whole lot of samples that we do with, with the first step of, uh, of the G9 plus. Then we switch to the GCMS, you know, we select a section and say, okay, these are looking like slightly different, you know, we need to look at it more deeply into the biomarker range, right? So we go into the biomarkers. So, so the G9 plus can also do the biomarkers, but that's not, uh, you know, very detailed. And, you know, obviously we need something more sophisticated. So that's why we go into the biomarker range. So, uh, so among that, you know, we start with uh, pristine and phytane. So pristine, phytane are isoprenoids uh, believed to be derived from phytol, a side chain of chlorophyll, okay? I believe a lot of folks, uh, you know, in the science world should know about the, the chlorophylls. So, which undergoes a uh, different chemical reaction, basically diagenesis, okay, in the water column to form pristine and phytine. So, this is like byproducts of that process. Uh, so, they are called as isoprenoids. So, then pristine phytine ratio generally indicates the redox conditions of the depositional, depositional environment. For example, low pristine over phytane values reflect suboxic environments. 
like deep water marine inputs okay so basically this ratio can be uh, used to identify if there are various types of source rocks contributing to the fluids in the reservoir or is the oil self source so this is very important right because we we are looking at uh, the second bone spring sandstone and then the third bone spring carbonate sandstone is a harky mill again both are sandstones they're tight rocks but they have been fed from other source uh, rock bodies right unlike the avalon which seems to have a mixture of both of these you know and uh, you have self-sourcing uh, and also you have a mixture of some migrated uh, reservoir fluids oil and gas as well so the pristine over nc17 so nc17 is an n alkane and then phytane over nc18 so nc18 is a n alkane so pristine NC17 and phytane NC18 ratios have been used for oil to source rock correlation. So this is a very classical way that the industry geochemistry folks use in the early uh, range of the biomarkers. These ratios are influenced by, you know, also the type of carrageen, the extent of generation and the maturation. So if you are looking at a mature oil, you may not see these biomarkers. You know, your kind of, uh, your chromatograph looks pretty lean. And if it's early maturity, you'll see a whole lot of these uh, beyond, you know, going all the way up to C35 and beyond, okay? So the samples from uh, shallower layers, typically like the, you know, the Bell Canyons, uh, Brushy Canyons, they show a higher pristine over NC17 ratio and lack of correlation with depth. They don't follow some kind of a trend. It is known that such formations are characterized by presence of migrated fluid. Okay, if papers have been published regarding that. And therefore it might be possible the occurrence of bi-graded, biodegraded rather than lower maturity oils. It's not because of low maturity, you find these kind of anomalies way up shallower in those formations, right? So on the other hand, a clear trend of maturity increase with depth is evident in wells in the region, in that particular region, in the Northern Delaware Basin also, that uh, starting from the Avalon Shale Formation with the lowest pristine over NC17 values recorded for the samples, all the way down to the, you know, the deeper wolf camp units, right? So this is kind of a trend. So high values going down to very low values in the wolf camp. So this is kind of a trend in that whole area. So for this particular uh, location, you know, for the Avalon in this well, the, the, the pristine phytoin ratio determined from the TEGC analysis especially was lower than one. So this, according to geochemistry experts, is indicative of an anoxic uh, depositional environment and would rather suggest a potentially self-sourcing carbonate. So you're kind of looking at that self-sourcing part. Uh, but the conclusion from the study is that, you know, the Avalon formation contains a mix between self-sources and migrated fluids. And then looking at the, uh, the other two formations, basically the second bone spring and the third bone spring carbonate, what we did was we, you know, those are producers, right? So we have one lateral and the, the Harky Mills uh, well A and the second bone spring sand in the well B. So we also got produced oil samples from those two wells. So we got uh, the oil characterization from the cuttings. And then we looked at the uh, produced oil samples as well. So we compared the produced versus TEGC from cuttings. We have a value, for example, for Pristino NC17 is 0.77. It's identical for both those samples. Pristino or NC18, pretty much close identical. So it's for the Harky Mills, we could get a repetitive uh, result for you know both the sets. In the second bone spring sand, we see small anomalies from the produced oil versus the TEGC. So it's early days, you know, we are still kind of evaluating. So pristine C17, pristine 8, phytane 18, C18, and pristine over phytane are in agreement with uh, produced oil versus what we see, you know. So those are also all under one, and uh, they seem to be migrated components. There is a difference between the, uh, the pristine C17, phytane C18 for the second bone spring and the Harky Mills, you know, they're separated by a carbonate interval. So there seems to be some barrier. So, uh, you know, when these formations were charged uh, and the timing, and there is some kind of subtle differences that we can pick up 
and, and these all samples and uh, TEDC characterizations and also GC uh, MS fingerprinting. Perfect. Thank you for that clarification. Now I wanted to pivot a little bit into signifying oils that are different from formations, but from a hierarchical clustering and clustering and principal component analysis. So during hierarchical clustering and PCA, what are the kinds of cutoffs that are being used to signify if oils are different from different formations? Well, that's a company secret. I'm not supposed to talk about it, but I'm, I'm kidding anyway. But you know, we'll, you know, these are industry standards, and uh, we do a lot of these kind of uh, evaluations in the geochemistry world. I'm not a subject matter expert on the PCA and H, uh, you know, hierarchical cluster and HCA, which a whole lot of geochemistry folks are involved in with this type of evaluation from oil samples and you know, looking at the biomarkers. So for uh, for this particular study, you know. Several GC uh, MS biomarker ratios were used for statistical data treatment, mainly related to the source and organic matter input. So like I talk, we talked about pristine over fighting, right? Then there are others like just using the numbers, uh, C23, C30, C24, C30, uh, and uh, you know things like that. We have uh, hopanes and, and, and uh, Sterines and things like that. So anyway, we don't want to get into those details because there's a whole lot of uh, details there from the geochemistry world. So we're looking at the statistical analysis of the GCMS compositional fluid data from selected, uh, you know, solvent extracts and produced oils to highlight the genetic correlation. So I didn't, you know, we're looking at second bone spring. Okay, how different is the second bone spring from uh, the the harky? Both are not self-sourced. They are separated. And then you drill one well, then you go to the second well, and then, you know, in a multi-well context, are these oils in agreement or not? You know, are they the same? Are they barriers or are they reservoir properties which cause these oils to have some differences? So we have seen some subtle differences over a period of time, you know, from the early wells still currently. But from the paper, you know, we see that for the Avalon formation, strong evidence of a carbonate source rock input in the reservoir oil was confirmed based on the high values of the C29 hopane versus the C30 hopane ratios. And the average value is 0 0.98. Then, uh, then there are other ratios which we looked at, you know, diastereins, sterines ratios 1.11 compared to, you know, compared to the second bone spring uh, sands and the Harky Mill sands, there are these distinct values that are different. So we could put them in those plots for, for the PCA. And we see that obviously the Avalon is far away from the second bone spring and the Harky Mill. The second bone spring and Harky Mill are relatively close too. Uh, but, you know, these cutoffs are not necessarily fixed cutoffs, you know, it could be variable, right? So uh, we don't have any strict uh, values that we adhere to is what I have been told from the uh, subject matter experts. But we're generally looking for a population that fit in a particular area on the plot and say, okay, so we got the produced oil and does the produced oil correlate to the cutting samples, you know, the cuttings uh, data, right? So this is early evaluation. So when we do multiple wells, you know, well number two, well number three, well number four in the same horizon, are they all in agreement? And so we've got some feedback from you know, the recent wells, which we have not incorporated in the paper. So once we get a, a more clearer picture on how do we look at with this multiple data sets, then we can apply a more, you know, more clearer, clearer cutoff. So for the moment, we don't have clear cutoffs and boundaries. It's falling within that range of you know, geochemical understanding of you know, what is different from one oil to the other, one type of source rock to another type of source rock. Okay. I also wanted to pivot to just the convergence of results. And I think this will excite completion engineers if they listen to this podcast up until this point. But I was wondering if you can talk about how XRD, XRF data converged with the mud gas results to conclude about different completion methods recommended for different targets. 
Very good. Yeah, this is a very, very important aspect of completions engineers. You know, so far we spoke, spoke about geochemistry. Of course, it's very important, but it's a geochemistry world, you know, so the geochemists are supposed to provide a quick look inputs for the completions engineers from the geochemistry perspective. But this is something more to do with the rock properties. So you were looking at the fluids in the rocks. Now we're looking at the rock itself, right? So we're looking at the inorganic part of, uh, for example, you know, um, well A and B, we're looking at two targets, right? So we're looking at the laterals. So well B is the second bone spring lateral. And uh, from our evaluation, looking at XRF and XRD data, we zeroed in on a few of these ratios. For example, uh, the well B, the second bone spring uh, has been divided into uh, two zones. What we've seen is uh, zone A and zone B. Okay, so silica over calcium and zirconium over niobium ratios. So from the zone A, from the landing point of the second bone spring sandstone well to about 13,150. So, you know, TD is like 15 something, you know, close to 16,000. So halfway through showed a higher silica over calcium and zirconium over niobium ratios, as well as higher sand and clays. While the quality of the lateral gets richer in the calcium towards, towards the toe with a corresponding drop in the grain size proxies. So what is the grain size proxies here? Zirconium over niobium. So we found that the zirconium over niobium is a very good indicator for the grain size proxies. So potentially better quality reservoir, you know, um, reduced matrix porosity is something uh, that we're looking at towards the toe of the well, right? So because of calcification. So silica over calcium, on the other hand, again, say more silica, perhaps the better. Uh, and if you see more calcium, so that's going to affect. So these are simple indicators. Two or three indicators is what we looked at to uh, highlight the reservoir quality, okay? So then the uh, target production zone for well A uh, was the third bone carbonate or the hard female sands again, which is a low permeability, fine-grained, uh, partially calcite cemented sandstone. So based on this little, uh, little uh, definition that we have, XRF results of silica calcium aluminum content was used to identify high sand zones. So high, higher uh, qu quantity of sand or percentage of sands, uh, the silica al aluminum ratio, for example, with drops in the calcium content indicating a shift from a calcareous lime to a calcareous cemented sandstone. So again, here we look at the grain size inferred from the zirconium over niobium ratio with higher ratios indicating higher grain size. Uh, then there also you have zone A, zone B, and zone C. So zone B in the lateral showed a higher zirconium over niobium and silica calcium ratios, possibly indicating a drop in the calcareous lime and the presence of calcareous cement. So these things are reduced. So cementing from calcareous matter is reduced, better quality reservoir, okay? So it's simple, but of course we have to do this analysis to you know, come to those conclusions, right? On the contrary, on zone C, because which is closer to the toe of this Archimel sandstone, uh, shows a higher abundance of calcium and a drop in matrix porosity. So they again inference of uh, a low from the lower uh, zirconium over niobium ratio and corresponding to a zone requiring higher average pumping, you know, pressure pumping rate to frack. So then it boils down to the treatment pressures. You know, how do you design the stages? You know. This is the first wells, first set of wells, right? Now we have a better understanding. What is happening in the near well bore? Is it important or it doesn't matter? So it seems like we have, we're figuring out that, you know, the near well bore scenario of the rock properties does matter when it comes to, uh, you know, getting those fracks propagating, you know? And so different uh, frac stages, and perforation clusters seems to be behaving slightly different over a period of time from the different wells. Depends on where you landed in the target. And along that lateral, you know, 5,000 foot lateral, has it been uniformly in this particular rock type or not? So we have seen that even within these sandstone, we have seen there is some levels of heterogeneity from one lateral to another lateral. So I think so far we've done three laterals in each of these uh, formations. 
And we could find out that, you know, these kind of differences in the near well bore is causing some differences to the way uh, the wells are behaving, you know, during the frack, uh, you know, process and uh, how the completions engineers are kind of responding to that and what to predict. How do you predict, you know, it's like, how do you forecast? How do you predict? So it helps the operator to define their landing strategy a little bit different, you know, perhaps in the future wells. Or when you go to the other uh, other future targets, you know, in other intervals in that particular area, so this helps them understand, you know, that near well bore uh, indicators are pretty much important. You compare and uh, combine that with, you know, the reservoir fluid properties that we saw from uh, the oil analysis, the mud gas, and all that. So this whole integration story comes into play when you look at this. And we have to provide like quick solutions or quick answer products to the completions engineers, you know, so that they can digest all this, right? And see how they can quickly apply these things at a very early stage, uh, you know, before the wells are put into the frack stages. Well, that's good to know that there are quick solutions out there. So I've asked you so many questions we dug deep into geochemistry. We talked a little about completions. There is an integration of numerous data sets, as you've mentioned before. And there's one question I did not want to uh, leave you without that I want you to answer. So what are some implications of this work for the industry that we've never seen before? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's very interesting because, you know, of course, it's been a whole lot of years and there's been a lot of technologies out there and, you know, uh, mud gas, advanced mud gas, quantitative mud gas, XRD, XRF, this is not brand new technology, you know, I mean, of course, papers have been published uh, since 10, 15 years ago in the conventional world with, you know, the advanced quantitative mud gas, comparing that with reservoir fluid properties, PVT and all that, right? So it seems like a very meaningful data sets that you can, uh, the clients, you know, internationally, you know, global majors are using that all the time in conventional context where you don't have reservoir fluid samples or you have well, well problems, you don't have sampling, you fall back on this quantitative mud gas characterization. And then the isotopes, you know, it's like your DNA, you know, it's like your fingerprint. So that's exactly what the, the source of that hydrocarbon is. So, you know, this part of the story from the hydrocarbon spectrum, oil samples. So putting all this together has not been, a, let's say an industry practice in recent years, of course, um, the, you know, the challenge has been, we don't have surface logging at the well site. So, you know, or the operators don't have funds and budgets for, for even doing a surface log. Forget about well and logging or anything, you know, there's no budget, right? So at least you get cutting. So then at least we can take the cuttings to a lab and do some kind of uh, characterization with the oils and, you know, production allocation. It has improved, a lot of new technologies are out there. Uh, several published papers, very successful campaign with, uh, with, with completions engineers, you know, earlier geochemistry and completions engineers were not always talking to each other a whole lot. You know, it was mostly geology, uh, maybe reservoir engineers, maybe, uh, and the geochemists, right? The completions uh, engineers were slightly cut off from that kind of real-time characterization and evaluation. So now it seems like, you know, in, in these days, in these recent years, uh, we are bringing these kind of whole integration story right from, you know, the beginning of surface logging acquisitions at the well site, the light volatile hydrocarbons, isotopes, uh, you know, and getting very early information on uh, XRD, XRF, you know, fast field analysis. Can we get uh, the oil analysis at the well site, for example, you know? That's revolutionary, right? It's not been done historically. In recent years, we started doing it. So can we get this whole GC up to C35 and get all those biomarkers and everything while we are still kind of drilling the well? If, you know, well number one, well number two, before you even drill the lateral, you already have information from, from the vertical. So where do you land the well? You know, how can you plan the, the second lateral? Let's say, okay, we drill through these benches, so the second lateral, or maybe the subsequent lateral when the rig is going to move to the next pad or whatever, you already have all this integrated story, a lot of it, you know, at the well site, already information is available pretty much within a few days to a week or whatever, you know. And then you send those samples to the lab and get some things which were not 
completed like PCA, HCA, you know, GCMS, you know, advanced uh, work. So integrating this whole set of data is really crucial and critical. You know, if you don't have some of the data that we acquired at the well site, you have to go back to the lab and just do the lab work and try to extrapolate things that you don't have. You know, how can you uh, generally extrapolate? Because there's a huge margin of error. Like I just told you that uh, tight rocks versus porous rocks, they'll have huge impact on, on the way your light and spectrum of hydrocarbons behave. So where can you get that data, right? You don't get that data by just looking at the rocks, right? Cuttings. So you have to have the whole spectrum. And this is where we have been successful in implementing that in um, not only this project, but you, you know, other projects as well, where uh, we bring this whole spectrum of evaluation, if that is possible, because we're not sending a tool into the open hole, so it's not intrusive. So all of this data is acquired at the well site in real time, or plus the samples that we, we can do at the well site or in the lab, right? So it's a combination and integration story uh, and working very closely with the operators. And uh, now you add uh, folks like completions, you know, they're strongly involved too, you know, and say, oh, okay, so this is a near well bowl story, you know, um, or is it not, you know, depending on the rock properties. So we're kind of opening and giving some insights to a wide uh, range of, uh, you know, uh, end users uh, from the operator uh, side and also, you know, generally in the industry as, as such. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for letting me pepper you with questions, Isaac. Thank you so much, uh, Yogeshri, for asking all these challenging questions. And, <laughs> and I hope I did some justice to, uh, you know, most of the questions. Of course you did. Thank well, you. folks, that's a wrap. I'm Yogeshri Pradhan. This is Petro Papers, and we're signing off.